Good morning, everyone. Welcome to my 11 o'clock worship service. We're glad to see everybody here. The announcements are in your bulletin and on the screen in front of you. And of course, David, as always, has his priorities entirely correct. Thanks, David. Good morning. And there are some that we will we, we'll need highlighting. And not only uh, the ones that are in the bulletin, but I'm going to ask Carolyn Brown to come up now and explain our Lent and Mission projects. As you, if you haven't seen them, as you go out, they look on the right. You'll see them. Carolyn? Okay. All the first thing I'd like to call my whole name is going to But you can do it now. You know, y'all know me. You can do it. You can do it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here to highlight your Lenten Mission Projects for this month. As you know, uh, you know, we are in the season of giving back because the Lord has given us so, so much. We have our first project, which is the homeless bags, and you can see those out in the best view. They got different colors and they have a tag on it telling you what items we need to place in there. Those will have to be in by uh, the first Sunday in April, which is April the 2nd. And we also have out on the counter in the best of you uh, names of homebound seniors. And we ask that you put your name, put your name on there for the senior that you're taking and your phone number so I can make sure that I can let them know uh, who's calling them because seniors are kind of like, and families are kind of like, you know, they want to know because they're not going to answer if they don't know who's calling. So and on that, you, you will pick up a card and the card has all the information about that senior. And it will tell you what you can do for them or what you, you know, what you need to do for them. And this week is, ooh, we're pressing, pressing, because Thursday, we have, we in need of donations uh, for the Ronald McDonald House. We have to go there and cook the food. They don't want us bringing the food. They want us to cook the food there at the facility. So we have a menu of, uh, that we're going to use. is chili, Fritos, salad, angel food cake, and strawberry, right? Okay. And Vivian is going to head it up. So if you don't want to get with her uh, and see about going over there with her on this Thursday, uh, please let her know. You can sign up the sheet out there in the best of you. And we have a church birthday. I'm going to be in the church. Be outside, right, Pastor? Outside doing beautification. And that's on March the 18th from 8 to 11. We're also doing, in conjunction with the Hispanics, we're doing a fire station collection. And that starts Monday, Sunday the 26th. We're collecting for that for the fire station uh, down the street. We're collecting Gator Aid and water, and we have bins out there for that. And the last one is Project 6, which will be a lunch for the daycare staff, and we're taking up donations for that. And that we'll start that on March 27th. So what we do out there, you have your places for your donations for each thing and each station for each sign up. And how we bless that. Thank you, Carolyn. Any other announcements that we need to highlight further? <laughs> Please respond to the call of worship. <laughs> God calls with a blessing. Our help is in God. God calls with a promise. Our help is in God. God calls through our questions. Our help is in God. God calls through the Spirit. Our help is in God. Please stand for our opening hymn, number 116, The God of Abraham Praise, number 116.
Thank you. Please be seated. Our lesson from the Hebrew Scriptures this morning is Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. said to Abraham, go from your country and your country and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Reminded that it's not just a time of remembrance of what you did, but a time that we continue to see what you do in our lives, Lord. And Lord, just be with all of those that are sick, Lord. Uh, we just ask for special blessings on those who are recovering from surgery and those that are homebound, uh, Lord, that they get lonely. And we just pray for each and every one of them. Uh, for all of those that we are going to adopt, and Lord, that we uh, bring into our lives. Is part of our lives and let them know how much we care about them. And Lord, we just ask you to be with us in our time together as we continue in this time of worship. In your name we pray. Amen. John chapter 3 verses 1 through 17. Please stand for this reading of the gospel. Nicodemus visits Jesus. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, the leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown up? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses. And you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be, be true? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you did not receive our testimony. If I had told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God, so loved the world that he gave his only son 
so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of God, read for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
It all began with his mother's death of cancer when he was just a boy. Disillusioned that God had not killed his mother, he set out on a path toward a full body <coughs> rationalism and atheism. He was also deeply bothered by the evil and the suffering of the world that just didn't seem to fit with whom he imagined God to be. For in the midst of C.S. Lewis's struggle with faith, God was not meeting his expectations. Expectations, they are a big part of our world, aren't they? Yes. There isn't a time that goes by when things are expected of you. Before you're even born, there's this expectation whether you'll be a boy or a girl, that you'll be healthy, that there won't be any problems. You're expected to crawl and to walk and to be potty trained at a certain age. And once school starts, and there'll be other expectations, you'll be expected to excel, to make good grades, to outdo your classmates, or at least to hold your own. You're expected to finish school, to get some additional training, to get a job. Expectations follow us in all areas of life. And then there's our expectations of God. Christian Arthur, Max Lucado, speaks of this idea when he says, we all have a way of completing of this sentence. If God is God, then if God is God, then there'll be no financial collapse in my family. My children will never be buried before me, and my prayers will be answered. Then, when these expectations go unmet, doubt sets in. When things don't go as planned, how often do we get angry with God? Maybe it's the loss of a loved one, or the unself of bad health, the sickness of someone you're close to, a divorce, an unresolved relationship, a loss of a job, an addicted relative, or just dealing with an aging old body, just to name a few. Whatever it may be, when things go bad, we wonder why God allowed our expectations to be dashed leaving us in a state of confusion. Confusion seems to be a place we find our dear friend Nicodemus today, isn't it? Was Jesus what Nicodemus expected? It appears from their first meeting that he left with less understanding than he came with. Maybe he thought Jesus was the Messiah. Most first century uh, Christians and Jews, I'm sorry, most of our century Jews generally expected that a Messiah was coming given the Old Testament prophecies. But with their exact expectations are not exactly clear to us. See, in the first century, there was this wide range of messianic expectations from a wide range of Jewish groups. Some expected a, a purely natural and a human political figure uh, that would be more powerful than the Romans and would lead them out of oppression. Some expected a, a supernatural, angelic, universal king. While others believed that the Messiah would be anointed and inspired by God. <coughs> now with that in mind, we don't know exactly what Nicodemus was expecting. But for the most part... Uh, the Jews uh, were expecting a different kind of Messiah than Jesus presented himself to them. Still, we do know Nicodemus saw something that day special in Jesus, right? Something that set him apart as one filled with God's presence. Nicodemus comes by night. Maybe he was scared of his, because of his high standing uh, as a Pharisee. Most scholars believe his nightly journey was symbolic of spiritual darkness. Jesus tells Nicodemus that being part of God's kingdom means being born from above, being born anew, being born again. Jesus goes on to say there's two births. One is from water, that 
is the human birth, and the other from the spirit that comes from God's grace. In other words, it will be a physical birth combined with a spiritual rebirth. Flesh and spirit that belong together in, in the new birth that Jesus envisioned. He then tells Nicodemus uh, that there is this, this is basically unexplainable. He says the wind blows where it chooses. And, and you can hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. This new spiritual birth, like the physical one, cannot really be explained, can it? We can observe the phenomena, but we struggle using human terms to describe it. Jesus continues to explain that no one has gone up into the presence of God except for the one who has come down from his presence, the Son of Man. See, in other words, he is pointing to himself here. And then the next part. It seems to be a bit of a peculiar story, but in essence, it is explaining all that is going to happen. How all of this is going to come to fruition. In the same way Moses lifted the serpent in the desert so that the people could have something to see and then believe, it's necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. And everyone who looks on him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, an eternal life. This is how much God loved the world that he gave his son, his only son, his one and only son. And this is why. So that no one need be destroyed by believing in him. Anyone can have a whole life, an everlasting life. God didn't go to all this trouble sending his son to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help make the world right again. Here Jesus is referencing a story from the book of Numbers when the people had sinned wildly when they were in the wilderness and a plague of snakes fell them. And as the people were bitten and started dying, Moses uh, went to intercede on their behalf to God, to speak with God. He says, that God instructed him to take a snake and to mount it on a wooden pole, like the armies used to carry, uh, bearing a flag as they went to war, right? So Moses did this. And when the people looked upon this bronze serpent, they were killed and they lived. So it is with Christ. He didn't come to meet the expectations of humankind. Rather, he came to do what needed to be done by him. As the people in the wilderness sinned, so did all of mankind. And so, as God once offered this temporary solution for the Israelites, he offers a permanent solution when Jesus hung on the cross for us. This passage offers the gospel really in a nutshell, doesn't it? Most of us have parts of it memorized. And yet, Nicodemus just clearly doesn't get it. He leaves confused and bewildered that day. Now, Nicodemus might not have gotten that story that day. We don't know if he did for sure ever, but, but I believe he did. I believe he did. The story did not end in the dark. He shows up again in John's Gospel twice. Not much is said in the second incident, but it's obvious in that second incident that he's still trying to grasp more about this Jesus he met that night. See, the Pharisees uh, had sent the police to arrest Jesus, right? Um, but, but when they came back instead, uh, the police were explaining that his message was amazing and that they were just astonished by it, and they came back without Jesus. Now, Nicodemus is with his his peers, the Pharisees, as the police return, right? And in general, the Pharisees are upset. They're upset. They seem to be kind of outdone with the police for not doing what they were told to do. But the Nicodemus, he seems somewhat sympathetic when he asks this. Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out 
what he's been doing. And then finally, getting close to the end of the book of John, we find Nicodemus in the full light of day with Joseph of Arimathea. Now, Joseph was a secret disciple of Christ who went to Pilate uh, and asked if he could take his body. And with him is Nicodemus, yes. And he was also found with something. He was found bringing an expensive mixture of burn and aloes up to 75 pounds. Very expensive. They went together. And they buried his body in the garden too. And see, I believe, I believe that at some point, Nicodemus had gone from letting go of his expectations to believing. To believing. We started today's message with a story about C.S. Lewis, who I also believe went from letting go of his expectations to believing. Lewis lost his faith at an early age because God failed to meet his expectations, right? He failed to meet his expectations with an acceptable outcome. Think about that. He left his childhood Christian faith to spend years as a determined atheist. And Lewis's long journey away from the faith and back again began with his mother's death when he was just a child. But the road to faith was cluttered with a lot of obstacles. Lewis once thought maybe even impossible to overcome. His conversion to the robust Christianity that he had required years of intellectual struggle. And it came only after being convinced that faith was indeed reasonable. It was J.R.R. Tolkien's friendship, the writer of The Lord of Kings and the Hobbit, that brought him to the encounter with Christ. On the 19th of September, 1931, Lewis and Tolkien, uh, together with a common friend by the name of Hugo Dyson, were taking their usual after-dinner stroll in the grounds of Magdalen College. They talked until 3 in the morning. And a few days later, Lewis wrote to a friend by the name of Archer Greaves saying this, I have just passed on from believing in God to definitely believing in Christ and in Christianity. He probably was the greatest thinker and contributed, contributor to the Christian faith in the 20th century. Like Nicodemus, Lewis had his night filled with light and his life changed radically. When Nicodemus and C.S. Lewis set aside their expectations of what God should be and what God should do and allowed faith to lead the way, their lives radically changed. Now, is it possible to have no expectations? If it is, that's how I want to live. Simply accept what's in front of me as reality and to live into it as deeply as possible. See, expectations, they actually mimic control. And when we seek to control others and God, we get ourselves in trouble. Besides, in reality, my expectations are not really reality. They're not full truth. So it's better to give them up. A life of no expectations is not a life without hopes or goals, though. It's a life striving toward these goals while acknowledging there is more that we don't know than we do know. Restraining our ego, uh, recognizing our limited viewpoints, admitting our ignorance, trusting God more fully, not judging others, and keeping silence will go far in helping us reach our goals. There is one truth, however, Jesus is reality. He is. If most of our life is lived with our own ideas and our own thoughts and imaginations and feelings, most of which are not reality, then we need him to consume us and rid us of our expectations. Could this be what Jesus was getting at when he taught, do not 
be anxious for your life, right? God provides, period, in a conversation. If he can take care of birds, <coughs> he can take care of humans. <coughs> Do birds have expectations? I doubt it. They just live in the presence, the present moment, in reliance on God. Ask yourself, do you, do you have expectations that include awakening each morning, living until 90 or beyond, having godly children and a happy marriage, succeeding in business, <coughs> or even overeating and not gaining weight? Do you expect God to heal you physically, always protect you from harm, and give you what you want? If so, you're setting yourself up for a world of hurt. He probably has other plans for you than just meeting your expectations. The antidote for this kind of expectations are humility and thankfulness. Think back on the last time you got frustrated because uh, your goals, your expectations were not met. Were you thankful in that time? Thankful for what happened anyway? Was your ego being confronted and you didn't like it? Humility gives you freedom from the wrong, to release control, to esteem others rather than just looking at your own desires to be met and trying to get that outcome, control that outcome. Thankfulness allows you to accept everything with joy and a gentle spirit Knowing everything is for your good, even when it might not look very good. You see, Lent is a time to look at our lives and to consider areas that need to be adjusted. It's a time of growth. Let's set aside our expectations of what God should do and be. Because part of becoming a mature Christian is learning how to put our boundaries and our expectations aside in order to listen to what the thoughts are. <coughs> it's difficult work, no doubt. And it may take a lifetime. But it is the work that shapes our lives. It calls us to live, to die on ourselves, and to be resurrected with Jesus over and over and over again. And with each time, our heart gets a little wider. We know grace a little bit more deeply. And we are able to follow Jesus a little bit more down that road of love. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, may we allow you to be center stage. May we realize our expectations. And know that, Lord, you're not always going to be met. But that you care for us and have good things in store for our lives, Lord. Prepare our hearts today as we prepare to go to your holy table. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 May we remember that Holy Communion is an it's important because it's a time that we come together and we encounter Jesus. The table of the Lord is precisely God. <coughs> Christ is present in ways we can't explain in communion. Well, uh, we don't just simply remember what God has done in the past. We experience what God is doing in the here and the now. All are invited to God's table. The God who made heaven and earth has created us in God's glorious image. And you are invited to God's banquet table to partake of God's self. Remember the blessings that we have received and the blessings we're called to be to others. Come to be blessed. Come to be fed. Come for the Spirit is calling and inviting us to be nourished and born anew. Please join me in our confession on page 12. Merciful God, if we confess that we have not loved you in our own heart, we have failed to be a good church, we have not done your will, we have broken your law, we have rebelled against your love, we have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray, bring us to joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news.
news, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you're forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. All glory to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It's right and good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord. God, our power and might, heaven and earth, full of glory, Hosanna in Christ. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in Christ. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in the remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves praise and thanksgiving as a holy living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, with confidence of children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us all to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many for the body of Christ, for we partake of one loaf. The bread which we break is the sharing of the body of Christ, and the cup over which we give thanks is the sharing of this time, I invite you to take your cracker Remember, it's the body of Christ broken for you.
invite anyone that would like to come up to the altar and pray, to feel free to do that. Thank you. 